get into something good. All right, Matthew 14, 22. And this is where Jesus is going to walk on the water. Okay, And it's really something that I hope you'll begin to look at as it was intended for you to look at. People say, well, don't you believe Jesus walked on the water? What good is that going to do you? I mean, what's that going to do for you next week when they're coming to repossess your car? What good is that going to do you when the doctor is going to come out and tell you whether the biopsy is uh, benign or malignant? What good is it going to do you? But if you understand about Jesus walking on the water, it'll make your life revolutionary because that is not written in the Bible to be some kind of, of a mythological story that happened 2,000 years ago. It's supposed to be something that happens to you today. So let's look at the hidden meanings of that story of Jesus walking on the water. The first thing that you'll find out in Matthew 14, 22 is he got his disciples into the ship and sent them to wait for him on the other side while he sent the multitude away. Very, very, very important point right there, okay? The disciples are those people spiritually who are into meditation. Those people he sends to the other side to wait for him. That means the other side of consciousness, the higher realm of consciousness is where you wait in meditation for Christ to come. That's what this means. The multitudes are sent away because the multitudes are the religious people. They don't believe in meditation. They don't believe in obeying Jesus Christ when he said the kingdom of God is within you. They don't believe in obeying Jesus Christ when he says if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. They don't believe in Jesus Christ when he says you take away the key because you don't enter within yourself. In fact, the religious people, the born agains all over the place will teach just the opposite to that and they'll say that's evil. And the Bible says about them, they call evil good and good evil. So Jesus sends his disciples to the other side to wait for him. He sends the multitudes away. That, that's really... <clears throat> that's really an important point in the, in the beginning of this story. Because if you're not going to enter within, and if you're not going to obey Jesus Christ, you're not his disciple. And that's when he'll say, well, you, know, you call me Lord, Lord, Lord. What, if you call, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I tell you to do? And what he's told you to do is enter within yourself into meditation, take no thought, and enter into the higher upper room where then he can drive the money changers out of your temple. That's what that whole story is. The Bible is written from an Eastern mentality of parables. It says Jesus never spoke, never taught, but in a parable. See? Even the stories of the Old Testament. The story, did, do you believe the story of Abraham and Sarah? Whether Sarah had a baby when she was 100 years old or whatever. Do you believe that literally? The Apostle Paul says you shouldn't. Because in Galatians 4.24, the Apostle Paul says that story is an allegory. Look it up for yourself. The Apostle Paul says, talking of Abraham and Sarah, and that he says, which things are an allegory? That means it's a spiritual story with a hidden meaning to it. It's like mythology. But that should make you more excited because you don't have to dwell on whether you believe something happened 5,000 years ago. You look for what it means to you today. Church, priests, evangelists, elders, they persuaded the multitude, didn't they? It says in Matthew 27, 2, that the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes to save Barabbas and kill Jesus. The chief priests and elders, they persuade the multitude. Jesus Christ can't talk to the multitude. He can't talk to a church. He talks to you. The only way God can talk is to you as an individual. He can't talk to a group. He can only tell you and direct you, go, go, go within. See, the Bible is simply God's finger pointing at the mysterious, but we're like a little bunch of dogs and cats. Did you ever tell your dog, it's over there, go over there. And what do your dog do? He'll stare at your hand. He'll stare at your finger. That's what we do. The Bible tells us, go within. Separate from thought. Go to the higher kingdom. Go to the higher consciousness. It's pointing to the higher consciousness, but instead of us looking at the higher consciousness, we stare at God's finger. We stare at the Bible and keep reading it and reading it and reading it and still are no further after reading it for 30 years than we were when we started. We're still reading old stories about things that are supposed to have happened thousands of years ago that we don't know whether they happened or not, but we're hoping that after we die, we'll find out. What do you mean after you die, you'll find out? Find out now while you're alive. The whole purpose has been misconstrued by born-again Christians who say you're supposed to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so that when you die, you'll go to heaven. Baloney! You're supposed to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so that you can die now to the flesh, rise to the higher consciousness, and go to heaven while you're here. Why are you alive? Because heaven is a state of consciousness. If everybody on this planet went to heaven today, within six months we'd turn it into hell. They'd be selling the streets of gold. You know that as well as I do. It's consciousness. There must be a changing of the mind. 
And Jeremiah 12.10, have you ever looked at that? Let me lean over here. Have you ever opened the Bible to Jeremiah 12.10? Jesus talks of the higher consciousness as a vineyard. And he tells you to be very careful about what grows in the vineyard. He's talking about your mind. Well, it's the, it's the beautiful place of God, which is called the pleasant portion, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. That's the part which is neglected by us. That's the part where we don't even know exists. See, we don't bother with it. But look what it says in Jeremiah 12, 10. It says, many pastors, P-A-S-T-O-R-S, have destroyed my vineyard. God's vineyard is the right hemisphere of the brain. It's accessible through the activation of the pineal gland of the brain. And if you look in Webster's Dictionary, you know what it says to you? The pineal is a vestige. It's something that once was used by people, but no longer is because of lack of use. The single eye, of which Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light, it's no longer used because of lack of use. It's atrophy. They've destroyed it because they've taught you, they've taught people for thousands of years, don't do that. It's evil. Because why? If you find out that God is in you, what do you need them for? It says, they have made, Jeremiah 12, 10, they have made my pleasant portion, God's referring to the right hemisphere, a desolate wilderness. You don't use it. It's dormant. All we use is the left side, the ego, the flesh, the carnal mind. But here is a statement of Christ in Matthew 14, 23 of, of his existence with the universal God. He's in a mountain apart. He's alone and he's there in the evening. That's what it says in Matthew 14, 23. When it says Jesus is in a mountain apart, alone, and in the evening, it means that's where you've got to find him. You've got to go to the higher consciousness, apart into the right hemisphere, apart from that left side, which is your carnal mind. In the evening, that's when you'll look for God. You're not going to look for God when it's daytime because everything's going great. You know, the sun's shining, I'm feeling good, man. No, it ain't no problems. Everything's, hallelujah, I'm okay. I don't need God. I don't need anybody. You don't go running around looking for God when everything's going good. You know that. You're too consumed in all of these things you're working at. And you don't go sometimes when it's so dark because you go looking for your friends. Just everything is in chaos. You've got to go borrow money. You've got to go do this. You've got to do that. Who's going to help you with the kid? And all of this stuff is going nuts. You go in the evening. It's at that point of time when the sun's starting to go down. In other words, things are starting to get a little ominous and you feel you need some help. That's when you go into meditation. It really hasn't gotten that bad yet, but it's getting that way. That's the evening time. That's where you go to the mountain or to the higher consciousness and find Christ alone. Now, in 1424, Matthew 1424, we get into the occult. For God's sakes, grow up. Let's all grow up together and stop listening to these people that shove things down your mind that says the occult is evil. Occult is not meaning demons or Ouija boards. That's not what occult means. Occult means the spiritual truths of God, which are hidden, by words, parables, allegory, symbolism, which the whole Bible is. It says Jesus never taught but in a parable. That means the truth of his statements were hidden in words that had different meanings. That's a cult. The story of Jesus walking on the water is pure occultism. It means there is a message hidden. Deep within that, there is a message, and it's totally about you. Now notice in Matthew 14, 24, it says the ship was tossed. In the midst of the sea, it was tossed by waves because the wind was contrary. The ship is you. You're the ship. It's your physical, mental state. It's the sea of the lower passions and desires and emotions, and it is tossed and turned by waves, which are the thoughts of the mind. The waves are the thoughts of the mind, and you know that sometimes those thoughts can come from you all different directions and just swamp you. What am I going to do about this? What am I going to say if he says this? Should I go over there? I think I'll do this. No, you better not do that. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? The waves are coming at you from all different directions. Folks, this is psychology. The Bible is speaking to you spiritually. That's why Jesus says it's hidden. That's why the Apostle Paul says when they read the Bible, there's a veil over their face because you don't understand the Eastern symbolisms. 
So you're the ship, you're in the midst of a bout with your emotions, the waves are coming from all different directions, and why? Because it says that the wind was contrary, which means that's denominations, that's traditions, that's the opinions of others. You get advice from your church, you get advice from your government, you get advice from your parents, you get advice from your kids, you get advice from your friends, you get advice from your counselors, all over the place, it's all coming in different directions, and you got more and more and more confusion piling up on you, that means your ship is being tossed about in the waves and in the sea, and you don't know what in the world to do. How do I know that, that, that winds being contrary means traditions and religion? In Ephesians 4.14 it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the tricks of men. And it says wind of doctrine. That's what it is. Go to any church and they're all different. There's a different wind blowing every time you walk in the door. There's a wind blowing this way and a wind blowing that way. And one wind's telling you don't go to the other place because they've got a bad wind. And there's all of the winds are blowing and everybody's confused. And that's why you got all of the garbage going out all over you that you do. And why is this wind blowing? Why doesn't somebody tell you you've got to go into the place of tranquility? You've got to go into nirvana. You've got to go into the place of calm. Why won't somebody tell you that? Because it's more important that they build their church than you have Christ within you. That's the ungodly, but that's the truth. You know, I get a lot of trouble saying this stuff. And... Uh, there's a lot of people that are really uh, bent on me not being here. I need your help if you share this, if you, if you feel that, as Paul says, there must be a renewing of minds from within, if you feel that Christ has returned and he dwells within and that we must turn within in meditation to rise above the thoughts of the mind and the thoughts of people, if you feel that that's the only way that we can bring peace and really turn this planet he uh, Earth into a planet heaven, then I need to share this. So we're finding out that the story of the disciples being in the boat, being tossed around, is a story about you and me being inside of our own psyche, being tossed around by every thought and every whim and everything that comes into our minds. But it says in Matthew 14, 25, that in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went walking on the sea. Do you understand? In the nighttime, when things now are getting dark, you're really getting depressed. But you've come to Jesus, you've come to Christ by elevating your consciousness above the mind into the blessedness of meditation where there is no thought. In the fourth watch, it means that this is the fourth watch. It means your, 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 your individuality, your fourfold nature. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. That's what four means in the Bible. Your fourfold nature. Right in the middle of your fourfold nature, right in the middle of your physical, intellectual, spiritual, and emotional being, in the time of the night when it's really getting dark, here he comes. Here he comes, Christ walking on the sea. In other words, walking on top of all of that stress, walking on top of all of that emotion, walking on top of all of that depression, here comes Christ. And remember, it's the fourth watch. And what did Jesus say in Mark 13, 37? What I say to you, I say to all, watch. And watch is an Eastern word used in the Bible for meaning meditation. You close your eyes, you drift up to that place above human thought, you don't try to get any feeling, you don't try to see anything, you don't try to say anything, you don't try to do anything, you just absolve yourself in the cosmic, universal, peaceful, tranquil presence of God and watch and watch and wait. And as you expose your consciousness to God, you are filled then with understanding. But God cannot compete with your carnal mind. So that number four is your fourfold nature. And that's why it says he came walking on the water in the fourth watch. It means in the midst of your fourfold nature, Christ comes to you walking above all of that, which is the struggles and the trials of your mind. But look, look what happens. Matthew 14, 26, the disciples see him coming and they're afraid. That is the fear of religion. Religion teaches you don't meditate because you'll open your mind to devils. Don't meditate because when you, when you separate from your mind, you don't know what you're going to get. Jesus Christ put that to rest once and for all when he said, listen, if you ask your father for a fish, is he going to give you a serpent? Baloney. You tell that Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is within me and that if I ask God for that which is a fish, meaning spirit, he's not going to give me a serpent, which means trouble, so keep your mouth shut and stop telling me a bunch of lies and trying to scare me. That's what happened to these disciples. When they saw this which is Christ, that means you. When you go into meditation and you look and you dwell above the thoughts of the mind, they'll tell you that there is something to be feared. They'll tell you there's something to be afraid of. And you'll be scared, not because it isn't God, not because it isn't Christ, but because religion has scared the pants off of you. 
See, you can't be frightened against meditation by the ignorance of others, no matter how religious they are. Christ comes to you in times of trouble. You've got to look above yourself. You've got to look above that which is the normal mind. And there you'll see him. And the reassuring voice of God. And Jesus Christ reassured them. He says, it is I. Has he reassured you? <clears throat> Do you have any word from Jesus Christ that he will come in meditation? that you can find him in meditation, that the kingdom is within you, that he has returned and he dwells within you. He said the kingdom is within you, Luke 17, 21. He says if your eye be single, your body will fill with light, Matthew 6, uh, 6 22. He says take no thought, Matthew 6. He says you take away the key because you don't enter within yourself, Luke 11, 52. This is all reassuring words from Jesus Christ that there is nothing to fear, that he is within you, and that if you enter into meditation, the only thing that you'll see is his glory through the single eye. See? That's your encounter with Christ. That's your Holy Spirit encounter. And the only way it will happen is when you separate from thought and meditate within yourself. And the Bible is telling you this. And now in Matthew 14, 28 to 31, we have that incident of Peter going out to walk on the water. Here's Peter portraying you and me. This is all consciousness now. This happens within inside of your head. That's where it happens. See? And here we're trying to reach out and find Jesus and, and get above all of the frustrations of the thoughts of the mind, which are the killers. Okay. I've seen so many people who will come into meditation, they'll find this peace, they'll find this love, and they'll actually begin to walk on water. In other words, they'll start to put all of those troubles beneath them and they'll see that what Jesus said really does work. But then after a while, they'll start looking down and they'll start to get involved in their old troubles again. They'll start turning their attention to how can they do this and how can they do that. Instead of meditating above thought, they'll start thinking and bang, they'll sink just like that. Oh, I don't know if meditation works. I don't know. Here I am sinking. And look what happens to Peter. Peter says, let me walk on water. In other words, the same thing that you say about, I want to learn how to meditate. I want to rise above these thoughts which are torturing my mind. We've got to keep that single eye focused on the higher nature. Otherwise, we're going to sink. We can't look with the mind because the fear that's been placed into us by religion, by people, by relatives, and by friends, and all of this junk will cause us to sink. See? Talking about meditation, water can mean two things. Water either means God's truth or water means our own emotions churning. In this particular story, it's our emotions churning. And here, because we believe Jesus Christ who said, the kingdom of God is within you. Seek it. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. We start to meditate. We start to rise above the thoughts of the mind. We start to walk on the water. But then, because of the fear that's placed into our carnal nature, it reasserts itself. We look down. We figure, well, you know, I got to do this. I got to do that. I'm not sure if this is working. Bang, we start to sink. We start to sink. We give it up and we're right back where we were. And Jesus turns around and he says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Christians don't have any faith in Jesus Christ at all because they don't do a blasted thing he said. They go to church. He never told you to go to church. The only thing that Jesus ever did in church was disrupt the service. They build big churches. Jesus says there ain't going to be one rock left standing on, standing on the other. He could care less about that stuff. Who, who told you to, to crochet and, and have uh, church socials and all? Who said anything about that? Not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, before you do anything, seek within yourself for the kingdom. Do you do it? Do Christians do it? They tell you don't do it. Jesus Christ says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. You can talk to me from now until the cows come home, folks. That means meditation. That's all it means. When you go to the eastern part of the world and you say the single eye, that means meditation. It's a cult. It means meditation above the, the thoughts of the mind. And you know what I said a cult means. It doesn't mean witches and demons. A cult means that which is hidden. And Jesus Christ only taught that which is hidden. That's why he never spoke but in a parable. Christians don't meditate above the single eye. They say it's evil. And, and Jesus Christ said, when you pray into the closet and close the door, that's an Eastern expression for taking no thought. Five times Jesus said, take no thought. Jesus said, you take away the key because you don't enter within yourself. And I'll ask you, do you enter within yourself? Do you meditate with the single eye? You don't even probably know what the single eye is, and yet you're going to church all of your life and you're reading the Bible. But you're not following Jesus Christ, you're following a church, you're following a pastor, you're following a tradition. Tradition. And Jesus Christ says, you make the law of God of no account because of your tradition. There's nothing more amazing in the world than to look at Christianity and then look at Jesus Christ and see that Jesus Christ says exactly the opposite of what the Christian teachers say. And they have to say the opposite of him because he says the whole thing means 
renewing yourself within, purging that within yourself, coming to grips with yourself. Physician, heal yourself. Within yourself is that tiny little place, that holy room, and you can find it by rising up and then entering into the right hemisphere by shutting down the left side in meditation. Giving that tithing, which is giving the 10%, which is you don't send these people your money, you're crazy. What are we doing with it? Look what these guys on television do with your money. You think God wanted you to send them 10%? Do you know how many people did send them 10%? The 10% is the left hemisphere of your brain, and you tithe that when you turn off that 10%, when you turn off the left side and turn on the right side. God does that in meditation. So you want to walk on water? Do you want to walk above all of the things that come against you? Do you want to walk above your disease? Do you want to walk above your heartbreak? Do you want to walk above all your family problems? Do you want to walk above all your emotional distress? Do you want to walk above all the guilt and depression that religion has put on you? Then you've got to meditate. You've got to follow Jesus Christ and he beckons you to come and walk above the sea, not walk through it, not walk through the emotions, the carnal mind. He's saying leave it, come above, but don't look down.